All right. Let's get into some climate change news. Um, <clears throat> uh, Peggy Gravel, are, I was just going to ask you, well, hope, maybe I'll ask you when I'm done with this. So the glass fire as I believe what one of our viewers is evacuating from. Uh, big fire, dear, lo uh, dear local friends of Deer Park, California, with heavy heart, I report that Fo Foothills Elementary original building is gone. Dorcas is gone. Community hall gone. Surrounding homes may be destroyed. So flames spreading toward East Santa Rosa while the entire town of Paradise gets an evacuation warning. Again, Paradise. The two California communities most, mostly... Sorry, most badly burned in 2017 and 18, now threatened again simultaneously. I feel ill. Um, so here's a picture of the fire. Pretty, pretty frightening. This is the glass fire approaches the outskirts of Santa Rosa wildfires. Um, chilling photos show the destruction and devastating devastation the glass fire has left. Behind in Napa County, fire crews are working to contain the wildfire that has already burned more than 2,000 acres and forced hundreds to evacuate. Uh, so I'm going to read a couple more of these. Uh, reports of the fire jumping Calistoga. Doga Road near Plum Ranch Road and St. Helena Road, which is just over a mile from Santa Rosa city limits. I see advising evacs in progress of 6,000 plus homes. It is now the third time since 2017 that my family had to have had to evacuate from wildfire in Sonoma County. Well, you think you might want to <laughs> rethink your, your location? Um, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying. Three years, you know, three out of the last four years, it might be time to reconsider your, where you're living. Um, stay safe, first responders. We love our home, but love you all more. Um, let's see. So evacuation orders in place and additional evacuations in progress. Um, there was another really crazy picture here. Driving uphill on Deer Park Road above pullout to bottom of passing lanes. Fire is above the road. Glass fire. Um, I want to try this. Find this other picture here. Oh, here we go. Yeah, this is crazy. This is from uh, yesterday. Um. Maybe I'll take that down. So the glass fire has now just come roaring over the hill. This is right along Silverado Trail, just north of Deer Park. Holy shnikes. Uh... Yes, Pedro Gravel. Yeah, uh, hope just hope you're stay just stay safe, and I hope that your your residence isn't threatened. Uh, it's a mess. This is a mess. Pegu Gravel, lots of millionaires on fire. Wineries, wow. You have an RV because of Guy McPherson? Okay. Uh, was it because you found Guy McPherson? Did he personally advise you to get an RV? Or how, how did that happen? But yeah, um, you know, it's it's a good look, right? If you, almost for anyone, really, uh, almost every, anyone is threatened by th climate change in these days and times, right? Anything can come up and destroy your community or your home. So a good thing to do is be able to, 
you know, be prepared to take it on the lam, right? To just head out. So a lot of people have been investing in uh, RVs or, you know, some vans or some way to like get out and be able to like sleep comfortably. You're better off than most. No, you just got wise to the rise. Yes. Okay. Got it. No, the Bobcat fire is not out, Scott Andrews, but it's much more contained than it was. It's still, I smelled a little smoke this morning. It's still going, but it's like over the mountain. It's not threatening us. Um, Donald McCarthy, if we don't plant some effing trees soon, there'll be no effing trees left to burn. Judy Truitt, my brother, sold his sailboat and bought, bought an RV. Um, Black Crow says, we are not allowed to live in vehicles permanently. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, if you just keep moving, <laughs> keep it moving. I think you're, I don't know. Anyways, let's uh, let's continue on. Uh, speaking of natural disasters, I actually had so there's been quite a bit of, of news and talk of um, dam situations, you know, dams being breached and or about to collapse in China due to their ongoing. Um, heavy, heavy rain season. This is a video of a dam break in China. After Typhoon Haishen triggers downpours. This is from September 11th. So um, a few or maybe a few weeks ago. It's been a perennial problem in China. China's flooding river after Typhoon triggered downpours. September 11th. Xinhua. The outburst flood waves of Mudan River broke a dam in Yilan County on the outskirts of Harbin, capital of northeast China's Heilongchang province, early Friday morning, after days of typhoon-triggered downpours. Local authorities had made evacuations in advance of the flooding danger. Residents in two nearby villages had been relocated to safe places. No casualties have been reported. The breach on the dam is about 80 meters long. Four people were killed, and one went missing after a rain-triggered flood battered Senjandong Autonomous County in South China's Guangxi Shuang Autonomous Region, local authorities said on Friday. The accident happened on Friday morning in Tangshui Village, which falls under the Bajiang Township. The flood has ruined a wooden house in the village. Rescue work is still underway. Half a million Chinese are evacuated because of the worst floods in 50 years. Water levels in more than 40 rivers, including the Yangtze, were dangerously high after the flooding. The landslides and mudslides have engulfed houses and heavy rain is expected to continue. All right. I know I realize that's a few weeks old, but I just wanted to play that all for you. That China has just been absolutely battered uh, by heavy rains this summer. And a lot of people are talking about the threat of um, some kind of food shortages or impacts to the food supply in China. I don't know. Um, there's been like dribs and drabs of information coming out that there's possibly some kind of food shortage si situation. Peggy Gravel, you're lit. <laughs> yes. Yes, you are. Um Yeah. Judy Truitt, that's where our monsoons went. Robert Arajo says China will be carbon neutral by 2050. Everything flooded and polluted. There you go. Right. I mean, you know, we're not seeing everything that's coming out of China or what's, we're not seeing everything of what is happening in China. Uh, but they have just been absolutely hammered. And guess what? 
they were hammered last year and they were hammered the year before and they were hammered the year before that. So this is not like, oh, what a crazy year. This has been, you know, the, the amount of typhoons and heavy storms, heavy rainstorms that have been hitting the entire area, Japan, China, India, Indonesia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, this has been something that's been escalating over the last few years. So we'll, we'll just call this a trend. We'll call this a climate change trend. Climate change is making this a thing that happens every single year. So at what point exactly does it become, you know, untenable for people to continue to live um, in the same system or in the same way that they're living, right? Uh, you know, when, when is it going to be a point at which people are going to have to change everything about the way that they live entirely? Just as in the wildfires in California, like at what point these things, you know, these wildfires happen every single year. So at what point do people, you know, decide to change everything about the way that they live because of the way that they live has become untenable, right? Um, Hero Hike says, I'm in Santa Rosa, California. Oh, had no idea. Are you, how, how are you doing? <laughs> uh, are you all right? Are you in a, in a good place? Or are you just doing some uh, disaster tourism? <laughs> it's apocalyptic. Um, I imagine, I imagine it is. Black Crow says, you guys, did you guys read COVID was found in frozen food? That complicates things a lot. No, I didn't read that. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. I'm not going to get into it today, but I just want, I need to, uh, I need to look this up. Oh, on food packaging. Found on frozen food imported to China. This is this is actually old, or a few, or a month old, ish. Interesting. Well, I'll, I'll come back to that maybe tomorrow. Um, let's get into this. Oh wait, hold on. Hold that thought. This is a really great question. Does California's gas-powered car ban? go far enough. That was a question that I had too, right? Because when I saw that, I was like, oh, that sounds really great on paper. What does this actually mean though? Speed is of the essence, but the Golden State's 2035 ban forgets about all the used cars that'll still be on the road. So there's that. So they're just banning the sale of new gas powered cars. So, so, okay, this is a good, uh, good uh, detail to know. And furthermore, California's ban on dealers from selling anything but zero emission cars from 2035 seems pretty radical at first glance, but in view of the seriousness of the climate emergency, it's not radical at all. Wow. So Bloomberg, this is from Bloomberg, by the way, or Bloomberg opinion anyways. Um calling it out as not radical enough or not radical at all. So there you go. I was literally just saying this yesterday. <clears throat> um, literally just saying this yesterday. So let's see if we can read this article. Uh, California's prohibition on the sale of new fossil fuel cars from 2035 doesn't seem at all that radical. This is from Chris Bryant, September 24th. Banning dealers from selling anything but zero emission cars from 2035, as California Go Governor Gavin Newsom decreed this week, sounds pretty radical on first hearing. Electric vehicles are still a relatively uh, niche pursuit. Charging them up isn't always straightforward, especially if you live in an apartment, and battery-powered cars tend to cost more than gasoline-powered equivalents, although that won't be the case for much longer. Predictably, the Trump administration attacked Newsom's executive order, and the fossil fuel industry is also unhappy. Oh, yes, they are. And that the lobbyists are working overtime to block this, delay this, throw all kinds of stuff in the road in front of it. However, in view of the seriousness 
of the climate emergency, something Californians need only look out the window to observe. Newsom isn't being very radical at all. The truly eye-catching thing about California's announcement is that the state will allow the sale of gasoline and diesel vehicles, whose emissions contribute to wildfires and heat, for another 15 years. Right. They, they could do this right now. They could do this in five years, and that would actually be radical, um, or at least more radical. Uh, yeah, we're not going to sell any more gas powered cars. Five years, no more gas power, power, new gas powered cars. And I'd say in 10 years, you'd have to have some kind of mandate where there's no cars. Uh, Again, again, I'm speaking from, you know, regular old run of the mill, everyday liberal land, right? Oh, this is great if you did it like this. But again, you know, forcing everybody to buy a new electric car will totally help the economy. But what's it going to do for the environment? Not good things. So, and ac- the actual real radical plan would be uh, we're not selling any cars <laughs> after 2035. And in 10 years, uh, or no, 2035, we're not selling any cars whatsoever in five years. And in 10 years, most, car- most uh, private vehicle ownership will be outlawed, right? That would be the actual radical plan. Um, but if you want to go for the centrist liberal radical plan, a radical plan in a centrist liberal eyes would be like no more gas powered cars in five years and no more gas powered cars on the road in 10 years. But again, that's not radical enough. Anyways, let's keep going. Uh, oil rich Norway by contrast wants to ban cars powered by fossil fuels by as soon as 2025. There you go. Britain might bring forward its phase out date from 2035 to 2030. Speed is of the essence because climate change is already doing enormous damage. Or maybe can't be stopped at all. And the key question is when we stop selling combustion engine vehicles, but when the last one isn't when we stop selling combustion engine vehicles, but when the last one is removed from the roads. Very, very key. Yes. Thank you for bringing this up. Dear author of this article, a year before California, a gasoline thing, hold on, think about it. A gasoline vehicle purchased in 2034, a year before California's ban comes into force, might continue spewing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere for more than a decade after that. How about two decades? Probably. Californians Californians will still be able to buy used gas guzzlers after 2035. To see why this, so there's absolutely zero teeth in this proposal, right? You see how this is. Very, very slow, very, very tepid. To see why this matters, consider some of the findings of Bloomberg's NEF's latest electric vehicle outlook. In 2020, about 3% of global car sales will be electric models. By 2025, that will hit 10%, rising to 28% in 2030 and 58% in 2040. Despite this incredible growth, all these vehicles will amount to only 8% of the 1.4 billion cars on the planet's roads in 2030. <clears throat> Eight percent of the one point four billion cars on the on the planet's roads. That's why my proposal is the most radical, which is no cars whatsoever sold <laughs> in twenty twenty five, and by the year twenty thirty, all all private ownership shall be banned. That's you know, Governor Governor Kevin Sandblom's proposal for the state of California. Oh, I know, shocking. Oh my God, what are we gonna do? Well, I don't know. I guess we're gonna have to figure that out. I guess we're going to have to do the, 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 the main thing first, do the radical thing first, and then figure it out after that, right? Reconfigure everything. BNEF forecast that. After dipping this year because of COVID-related mobility restrictions, emissions from road transportation will keep rising until 2033. Oh, my God. While they'll decline after that. Oh, well, isn't that great? These emissions will still be higher in 2040 than they were in 2019. Holy shnikes. So we've got 20 whole years of rising emissions just from cars, just from cars. Do you see that we need something completely? We need a lockdown. We need a straight up climate change lockdown. Like, listen, guys, climate change is really bad. Way worse than coronavirus because extinction. Uh, So we're going to lock everyone's ass in their homes. Nah, nope. We're not driving cars. We're not going on planes. I'm sorry. You can't do that anymore. Too bad. You can go. You can all just run outside. You can walk outside. You can get on a bike. You can ride around. You can maybe take mass transportation. 
Uh, we're also closing down all Targets, Walmarts, uh, everything but grocery stores. Yeah, I know. You've already got way too much stuff. <laughs> so you're not going to need any new shoes or T-shirts or clothes. No, you don't need that. You don't need that. I know. Radical, isn't it? Without electric and hydrogen-powered vehicles, the rise in emissions would be greater still, as the chart above shows, but the existing global car fleet won't become carbon-free magically just because you can't buy a new combustion engine vehicle. Most local governments and countries that have proposed bans so far are pretty vague about how they'll, uh, they'll be enforced and how the last fossil fuel vehicles will be ordered off the roads, right, whenever that might be. One exception is Singapore, whose 2040 ban will apply to all cars, not just new ones. Excellent. Singapore, good on you. But are they only talking about gas cars, or are they talking about electric cars? Are they talking about all cars? That's what I'd like to know. Setting a 2035 cutoff only for new sales, as California has done, avoids the awkward dis discussion about what to do what we do about all these combustion engine vehicle consumers have already purchased. While you can understand why politicians wouldn't want to provoke American consumers any more than they need to, this is unfortunate. Well, they need to, provoking is, this is a really good time to provoke. You know, when everybody's like, oh, what's going to happen? This is a really good time to be like, this is what's going to happen. Boom. California is giving the car industry and infrastructure planners time to adapt, but they've already had plenty. Anyways, you guys get the point. The point is nothing. <laughs> the point is this, this changes very little, very, very little, at least for the, for the immediate time being. Cougar W, thank you so much for the super chat. Kevin Samblum for CA governor. That's right. Bringing, bringing home um, some real radical climate change action. <laughs> uh, Yes. Oh, Jesus. I really hate when this happens. Hold on, guys. I got to re, re up my, um, hold on. I got to re up my, uh, my thing. Scott Andrews, no buffering allowed today. I'm sorry, man. I'm just, you know, for whatever reason, my streaming app is just, likes to just do all the stuff. Anyways, picture within a picture. It's pretty cool, huh? Uh, so I'm back. Everything's fine. I just had to restart this thing. Black Crow, thank you for the tip. I'm going to check that article out or, or look into that a little more. Buffer is kind of cringe. <laughs> yeah, I don't, well, I, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Okay, let's go on to the last thing I want to cover today. That's, that was pretty good, though. Have to say that. Ooh, this is what I want. I want to cover this for all the... Um, the carbon fee and dividend folks. The trouble with carbon pricing. This is from bostonreview.net. Carbon pricing has dominated conversations around climate policy for decades, but it is ineffective. It's what I, I've been trying to tell people that carbon taxing and carbon pricing is like, uh, it's really just a money game. It's like a Ponzi scheme for carbon. And by the time they actually agree to implement this stuff, and by the time they figure out that it doesn't actually work, it's going to be 30 years from now, right? They're going to they're going to they're going to have a, you know a decade long debate over oh carbon carbon pricing we can't possibly do that oh it's wild eyed it's radical. Look what happened in France, and then they're going to do it, and then they're going to go oh my god, and everybody's going to freak out, and the whole everything is you know this is I I just. I, I would really like people, and I mean experts, and I mean economists, and I mean politicians, to rethink this carbon tax scheme that they've they've come up with. Because the whole the other thing about carbon pricing is it's like, 
let's save the economy. Let's keep, you know what I mean? Like, let's just implement this little tax that lets business as usual continue and lets everybody just continue doing all their stuff. But like, oh, we're paying a carbon tax, so everything's fine, right? That's what all of that is all about. All of it is all about continuing business as usual, keeping the status quo going for as long as possible. That's what carbon taxing is about. <clears throat> Sorry to tell you if you haven't figured this out yet already. Over a decade ago, California put a price on carbon pollution. At first glance, the policy appears to be a success. Since it began in 2013, emissions have declined by more than 8%. Today, uh, hold on one second. At first glance, the policy appears to be a success. Since it began in 2013, emissions have declined by more than 8%. Is that true? But they're still rising, right? Today, the program manages 85% of the state's carbon pollution, the widest coverage of any policy in the world. California's effort has been lauded as the best designed carbon pricing program in the world, but is it really stopping climate change? Are, are we still seeing emissions rising? While the policy looks good on paper, in practice, it has proven weak. Since 2013, the annual supply of pollution permits has been consistently higher than overall pollution. <laughs> Uh, as a result, the price to pollute is low and likely to remain that way for another decade. This slack, the slack in the system has made the policy better at revenue collecting than changing corporate behavior. There you go. That is not a surprise. The legislator, legislators aimed to tighten the law in 2017. Oil and gas lobbyists thwarted their efforts. Of course they did. Of course they did. Just like they're going to thwart the whole, like, we're only, we're not going to sell gas powered cars after 2035. You know, you know, you already know that they're lined up. Nope, nope, never going to happen. Not going to happen. We're not going to allow this. One powerful labor, labor union initially supported ending free permits for big polluters, but reversed its position after Chevron offered it a union contract to retrofit refineries. Oh my God. Oh my God. The final legislation. <clears throat> prohibited enacting new regulations on California's fossil fuel industry. Regulations that could have done more than the state's weak carbon price. Even in one of the most progressive environmental jurisdictions in the world, California lawmakers failed to secure the necessary reforms for effective carbon pricing. There you go. Boom. Done. Exhibit A. <laughs> Nothing, nada, doesn't do jack, um, and they're not, and it just allows them to like to fiddle with the knobs. It allows the politicians to fiddle with the knobs and go like, well, we're you know, there's a new bill and we're gonna vote on yeah, blah, 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 blah. Nothing's happening, right? Rather than carbon pricing, other regulations, clean electricity standards, clean air, uh, car programs, and aggressive energy efficiency, even, come on, man, come on. We need to be talking about degrowth, degrowing the economy, degrowing consumer spending and consu uh, consumption, period, the end. Not clean energy, electricity standards, not clean car standards, not aggressive energy efficiency. No, no, no. Deserve much, much of the credit for the state's progress. So apparently these things are better than the carbon pricing. All of this is just three-card Monty. All of this stuff is three-card Monty. For allowing more consumption, more energy use, more fossil fuel use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. California is one of only 12 U.S. states to have adopted any carbon price at all. The idea has simply proven difficult to enact. When Oregon attempted to vote on a carbon pricing bill in 2019, Republican legislatures, legislators fled the state and hid in Idaho <laughs> to prevent the quorum necessary to pass the law. So you see how this is going to go. This is just going to keep on going for another, you know, decade or two decades or however, however long we have left to live on this planet. And this isn't just happening in the United States. The policy is politically unpopular around the world, right? What happened in France when France enacted a carbon tax? Well, the yellow vest happened. <clears throat> when Australia passed a modest carbon tax in 2011, that was quite a while ago, Things got ugly quickly. Right-wing radio hosts hurled misogynistic invectives against Prime Minister Ju uh, Julia Gillard 
Angry protesters descended on the Parliament building in Canberra. Climate-denying opposition leader Tony Abbott crisscrossed the country, accusing the government of economic vandalism. Oh, my God. Um, well, of course, that's going to happen if nobody understands what climate change is or where we're at with climate change, right? If, if the media continues, and the media and the entire apparatus of you know, economic consumption continues to mislead people on the facts of climate change, of course, everybody's going to be like, no way, man, we can't have this at all. This is an outrage. Uh, Abbott quickly repealed the policy. In France, a proposed carbon tax fueled the country's yellow vest movement, triggering the worst domestic riot since 1968. The proposal was soon abandoned. Uh, God, it just, this is just plugging holes in the most just like unimaginative way. A tax on carbon. We'll just tax you. Uh, despite its political deficiencies, carbon pricing has dominated climate policy conversations. Why? I don't even understand because it's just so dumb. I mean, climate scientists are good about uh, good on climate, bad on you know solutions. Sometimes, I know carbon tax. Dumb, 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 dumb. I'm sorry, just dumb. As uh, as your governor of California, Kevin Sandblum, I will <laughs> I will do something totally different. <laughs> Guys, vote for me. <laughs> I'm just practicing. Don't worry about it. I, I, I'm, I'm actually finding the whole scenario just laughable on many levels, but whatever. Hey, guys, remember to like, share, and subscribe, and you can support the channel. Hit the links below, uh, PayPal, Patreon, Square. Uh, also, if you'd like to watch the live streams, you can watch the live streams on my Patreon channel. You can subscribe for as little as a dollar. Um, so hopefully I will see you over there and thanks so much.